Welcome in to Two for One Drafts, the Wednesday edition of the Two for One Drafts podcast. I'm Austin Gale with Mike Renner, ready to talk some of the best prospect fits on day two of the 2020 NFL Draft. I feel like we've talked about round one a ton, the top prospects ad nauseum. So we got to get into day two. We also have a KJ Hamler interview. I talked to KJ for a bit. The beginning of the interview is a little choppy. Bear with me with the Skype conversation. But towards the back, the back end of that interview, it gets very interesting. He talks about the most valuable traits for the receiver position, what he thinks he does well. Apparently, he's going to send videos of him running routes and catching footballs to prove that he does have good ball skills to NFL teams uh, in the near future. Uh, what's your What's your opinion of that, Mike? Uh, he needs to, but we got game <laughs> tape that says maybe a little bit otherwise, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It was funny though because I brought you know he brought it up multiple times in the interview, and you'll listen to it at the end of the podcast here. But multiple times in the interview, the fact that he needs to improve his ball skills, he needs to improve his ball skills. I need to show that I have good hands. That's stuff that's come up on tape a ton with him in the pre-draft process. It's interesting that he is prioritizing it. In addition to that, we've got some good segments on the back end here. Bar fights, continuing the bar fight segment. We're going to discuss a little bit of a take here between Mike and I. We also have our perfect pairings segment where we talk about some of the best NFL player comparisons for top draft prospects. And then we're introducing a new segment, Had Too Many, where we reference some bad takes. We're going to start with our own takes to show that this is a lighthearted segment, one of which with no no malice involved. But uh, in the future, maybe we'll bring up some other takes as well from other draft analysts and pundits at bat. Uh, Before we get started, I also want to bring up that we are still doing our draft guide giveaway for podcast reviews. If you leave a review and your email, we're going to send five podcast reviewers um, a free 2020 NFL draft guide, which is available if you don't want to leave a review to all edge and lead subscribers, go subscribe to grab your draft guide. All right, let's get into this, Mike. Let's start some prospect fits. We each got our own about 20 guys we want to bring up. I'll kick it off. Or no, you go ahead and kick it off. Give me a fit on day two. I'm going to kick it off with a guy we've actually mentioned before uh, as a fit for this team, but Ben Barch, the St. John's offensive tackle to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think pick 45 is where the value would be for that. Like I said before, the Bucs, they love themselves. Some D3 offensive linemen. They have uh, Ali Marpet on the roster and... Uh, the other guard who's now the name is escaping me, uh, Alex Kappa also as well. Now, both those guys ended up kicking into guard, but I think Ben Barch could stick at tackle if they don't go tackle in the first round. So Ben Barch, right tackle to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, get Tom Brady some help there. And maybe you don't need a first round pick to necessarily address that need, even though I still think they probably do. Yeah, I was going to say that 14th overall pick looks a lot like it's going to be offensive tackle, especially with how good this offensive tackle class is. They could have their pick between Wirfs, Wills, Andrew Thomas, Mackay Becton. There, there's going to be somebody. Have, okay, they will not have. They won't. They won't have their pick. One no, of them, no, no. One of them yes. might fall there. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, I meant. I meant that there should be one of those top guys still available at yeah, 14. Yeah. Though there is a chance that all four of them are gone. They're that good. You could see a handful of offensive tackles all go before the 14th overall selection. And if that's the case, I think that makes the Ben Barch fit, fit even more so. Because if you don't get your shot at the top four offensive tackles in this class and you force, let's say, an Ezra Cleveland at 14, I think that would be more of a concern than maybe taking Ben Barch at pick 45 on day two. All right, I'm going to stay with offensive line. I'm actually going to jump to Ezra Cleveland at 46, pick 46 in this scenario, going to the Denver Broncos because I've talked to some Denver Broncos media recently, and they're saying everyone knows the Broncos want to go wide receiver in the first round, but is there any, is there any reason for them to maybe attack offensive tackle? Yes. They've allocated resource there with Garrett Bowles and and, and, uh, Juwan James, but neither of those two players are top flight offensive tackles. Garrett Bowles has not panned out. Does it make sense for them to reinvest in that position in the form of draft capital? Not so much with a first round pick like they did with Bowles, but rather uh, grab an athletic offensive tackle out of Boise state, like Ezra Cleveland. I think it makes sense. Allows him to develop behind two veteran offensive tackles and also come in and play. If things don't go sound and Juwan James continues to battle injury. I am just going to say, I don't think he makes it that far. I okay. think someone like San Francisco would pull the trigger before and have him start similar thing, have him start inside at guard. And then once take, have take over at left tackle for Joe Staley, I think Tennessee would rather he start than Dennis Kelly next year. I think Seattle, one of those teams, I don't see all of them passing on Ezra Cleveland after what he did at the combine. Yeah, that combine is going to move him that much up boards. I mean, where was he on PFF's board before the combine? I feel like he wasn't inside. 90 the top something. It was like around 90. 
Probably. Yeah. You, you put up athletic testing like that, you're going to go a lot higher come draft mm-hmm. day. So maybe he doesn't make it to 46. If he does, though, I think the Denver Broncos would be a good spot for him, and that would be somewhat of a steal. Um, give me your next pick. I you actually took my team here. I thought Broncos at 46, a great fit for them would be Jeff Gladney because Isaac Yadam ain't it. I don't think you want... <laughs> Uh, what's his face? The slot cornerback from Chicago, whose name's now escaped. Bryce Callahan. I don't think you want Bryce Callahan playing outside cornerback. Uh, I think you'd rather he stay in the slot if possible. You have AJ Boye, so that means one more outside corner. I think Jeff Gladney is a perfect fit in terms of he played almost exclusively quarters uh, sort of looks at TCU. That's you know what Gary Patterson runs for the most part. And that's a lot of what Vic Fangio runs as well is split field safety looks. Uh, that's what he'd be doing. It's a very similar sort of projection from what he did to college to what he'd be asked to do in the pros. And obviously he was very, very good in college. So I do think Jeff Gladney, if he slips all the way to 46 would make a ton of sense for Denver. I mean, I really do love Jeff Gladney. It was interesting. I looked up like what percentage of, you know, co- primary cover snaps he was playing in this past year, he played a ton of quarters at TCU, which I found, found interesting playing in the off coverage a bit there at TCU. But I think Jeff Gladney at 46, I don't know if he's going to fall that far. Would you say, I think this guy could be at the back end of the first round, if not the top of day two, or do you, do you think? I don't know. 46? Yeah, I, his testing wasn't great at the combine, you know, like his three cone was pretty rough. He's not, doesn't have the great doesn't have size that a lot of teams would covet in the first round. So I could see him. It would be a pipe dream for them if he did slip to 46. But I, I think there is a shot. It does happen with as Man, many as there are. I mean, talk about some dream scenarios though for the Denver Broncos at 46. Say they do grab their favorite receiver in round one. If he's available, maybe a rugs, LaVisca Chenault at 15 and then able to grab either Ezra Cleveland or Jeff Gladney at 46. If they do fall there would be dream picks for the Denver Broncos. I'm going to stay with the cornerback position and go to Noah Igbenogany, the Auburn corner going to the Falcons at 47. This guy does have good athletic testing. A lot of people like this guy's upside. So he could go before that, but if they aren't able to get a guy like CJ Henderson in in the first round and they want to address cornerback in round two. I think Noah Benogany, they love athleticism. Noah Benogany has that. I think Atlanta would jump at the opportunity. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing. I think Benogany, I'd bet money he'd go off the board before Gladney because of his age, because of the athleticism, like you mentioned. So dropping all the way down to the Falcon, the second round, it would be, I got a dream scenario that you'd be a perfect fit for what they do defensively. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not sure a guy with that, those sort of traits ends up making it that far, but hopefully, I mean, I think that would be a great pick for them. Like you said, very similar to a CJ Henderson boat around later. Yeah. And what, what's interesting, is, and it might maybe give us some insight here on the board. Like, so with no, I've been these guys who have like, you know, the age and the athleticism, those things, he's not inside the first 32 players on PFF's board, but you predict that he will go likely up, you know, inside the top 30, top 35 picks. What kind of separate, you know, when you're putting together the board guys that you think will fall to day two, but maybe are up there in the big board. What's up with no, I I have no clue what you just asked. Me. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Uh, I, I, phrasing it in that, like you're, you're, you're saying you're not seeing no Benogany likely fall to day two, but you still, you know, oh, yeah. the PFF's board still doesn't have him up there, I guess. You know, what's your opinion there? Oh, so like my board is just what, what I, how I feel about these players. And I, I just, the way the NFL would feel is obviously going to be different. And the NFL usually covets younger athletic athletes more so than, you know, like they covet athleticism more so than, you know, necessarily on field production. And so we obviously going to covet on field production more. Yeah. I guess that's where the bigger differences is in the NFL's perception and PFS board. All right. Take, uh, take me to your next guy. All right. Next guy. I'm going to go with to pick 51 Cowboys fans. Don't go, don't go edge in the first round. You don't, there's not going to be a guy there worth, drafting on the edge in the first round. It's a massive, massive need now for the Cowboys. I think second round though, Julian Aquara, the edge rusher from Notre Dame coming off a broken leg, didn't have any pre-draft testing besides the bench at the combine. But I think this dude, I mean, we've talked about him a ton on the podcast. We love him. He's in the top 32 in our draft board. If he falls all the way to 51, he could fill that need uh, in a big, big way at the edge position for the Cowboys. Yeah, I mean, they need edge badly. And I think you've talked about it before that there's a chance maybe they force a Caleb on chase on in the first round at that pick because they don't want to start Dorrance Armstrong opposite of Demarcus Lawrence's next uh, upcoming season. But I think if they could still pick for value it with the first round, maybe grab a safety cornerback at that position, I think they're going to be in a better spot. And if they could do that and add Julian Aquara in the second round, you're talking about filling needs while also addressing the more valuable player at that pick. I think that's a that's a slam dunk 
for the Dallas Cowboys. Moving to uh, my next guy here, Michael Pittman Jr. to the Indianapolis Colts at the top of round two. Because they trade away their first round pick for DeForest Buckner of the San Francisco 49ers, they won't have an opportunity to upgrade the wide receiver position in the first round. But they are fortunate, two picks into the second round, to have a pick there. I think Michael Pittman Jr. fits what the Colts want slash need at the receiver position. A bigger receiver has underrated, uh, underrated separation ability, in my opinion. A guy who's good in contested catch situations. I think him... T.Y. Hilton are a good pairing for Phillip Rivers in Indianapolis and immediately makes that team better. Now the next step is trying to get any type of positive ROI out of Paris Campbell in the slot after that because you put a ton of resource there, second round pick a year ago, I believe. I think the Indianapolis Colts, Michael Pittman Jr., T.Y. Hilton are a better team. Yes, I, I think 34, I bet, I bet some good money that it's going to be a wide receiver, either Pittman or T. Higgins if Higgins falls out of the first round. Would just make too much sense, you know. Stylistically, pairing them with Philip Rivers, what he likes to throw, the routes he likes to throw, how he, you know, the sort of receivers he's targeted over the course of his career. Both those guys fit that bill. They really don't have a guy like that also on the roster in Indianapolis. Uh, that one, like I said, I, I think I'd bet good money that if those two are on the board, come thirty-four, it's going to be one of them. All right, next guy for you. All right, next guy for me, and they actually, um, the Houston Texans 57, they just signed a de- t- defensive tackle before this, but I still think they could use a real nose tackle because they signed Timmy Jernigan. Not really a nose tackle, undersized uh, if you are playing him on the nose. I think Devon Hamilton, Ohio State defensive tackle at 57. I've heard he's likely to go in the top two rounds, Devon Hamilton, somewhere in the second round, uh, if, and won't make it long in the third if he is there. I think that makes a lot of sense for them because of, uh, you know, losing DJ reader, not having a lot outside JJ Watt and obviously not being able to rely on JJ Watt with his injury history of late. I, I do think that uh, Devon Hamilton just makes a lot of sense in terms of need fit uh, and, you know, value at that point. I think Devon Hamilton can come in and do a lot of what they had DJ reader doing at high level early on. I mean, because DJ reader, very good against the run. Maybe Devon Hamilton isn't, at reader's level right out of the gate, but I think close to it. I mean, we saw at the senior bowl him perform well above expectation. They kind of like bursted on our radar there in Mobile. And I think with Devon Hamilton losing DJ Reader and not paying him all that money that the Cincinnati Bengals did and then replacing him with Devon Hamilton, that's good business. That's a good strategy for the Houston Texans. And it's finally good to talk about the Texans potentially in a positive light, you know, because it's they've been getting bagged on this entire offseason. Devon Hamilton round two, I think would be good good upswing for them. <laughs> um, moving to the next guy here, my guy, Antoine Winfield Jr., the Minnesota deep, you know, free safety, played a lot of free safety this past season, has battled injuries, has that NFL blood pedigree. His dad played in the NFL for the Vikings for some time. Undersized, not a very twitchy athlete. And I think th- those have, you know, and the injuries you throw in, there are concerns. I think that's why he slips to day two. But on day two, I mean, this guy's instincts, ball skills, all that stuff are still very, very good. And I think he can have plus play on the back end because of that. I mean, his route recognition, all these things. You listen to his post-game interview after he has, I think it is a game-winning interception. I think it's maybe Fresno State in overtime. I can't remember. It was a red team. But whoever it was, he talks about it in the interview, and he says, yeah, I recognize – you know, I was in cloud coverage, cover two, recognized it, speed turn, took the interception, and, and you know, next, that's all she wrote. And it's like, hey, he just rattles these things off very quickly. And I, I think with Antoine Winfield Jr., not going to love the athlete that he is, not going to love the injury risk, but I think what you do love is that he brings playmaking potential to the NFL with instincts and ball skills that should translate. Where do you have him going? 43, oh yeah, fair. 40, uh, either pick 43 <laughs> or pick 50 of the Chicago Bears. I didn't even talk about the fit, just talked about the player. But with Antoine Winfield, he comes in to play deep safety for the Bears and really help on the back end, be that playmaker for them that they they kind of need at safety position right now. Yeah, no ha-ha, Clinton Dix anymore. And obviously no first rounder for them. So I do think safety would, is one of the few positions on that roster you could qualify as a need. And obviously you can't argue with the value at that point. So I can get on board with Winfield to the bears for sure. All right. All right. My next one, I will go with Minnesota Vikings. I, like I, I've said this before, I think they go wide receiver cornerback in round one. That, that to me is where the value is on the board would make the most sense. A lot of good corners and wide receivers going to be available at the end of round one, obviously a huge need for them, but then they go three tech in the second round. Pick 58, I have going Justin Matabuke, Texas A&M. That fit I love in terms of uh, his penetration ability, his pass rushing potential 
and what he's already shown with 40 plus plus pressures each of the last two years at Texas A&M, uh, they don't have, they got nothing right now on that roster uh, coming close to what he can bring to the table as at three technique. Yeah. I mean, I think with, with just about UK, I think he's getting underrated in, in this class because there's other, you know, top tier defensive tackles like Derek Brown, Javon Kinlaw. But I mean, you turn on his tape, he's one of the better interior pass rushers, a good athlete at that. And I think the Minnesota Vikings definitely have a need there. And when you bring up the first round with the Vikings, I think wide receiver cornerback, I was on Vikings radio recently or Minnesota radio recently, but I also don't hate, AJ Epinesa at 22. I mean, if, if there's a good chance that he could be there on the board, he also could fall to day two with his athletic testing and no opportunity at the pro day to show he's got better numbers. But like AJ Epinesa fits that defense very, very well. I, I like Matt Abuke fit as well. But I think in that first round, what, what's your opinion of AJ Epinesa at 22 or 25 for the Vikings? I can get on board with Epinesa. Like I, I would, I would like that pick more than I would say a you know, reaching for a Marlon Davidson or someone like that defense tackle position or reaching for Ross Blacklock. Like I, I'd rather have Epinesa and his skill set than one of those guys. Yeah, there you go. All right, let's jump to my next guy here. Lynn Bowden Jr., the quarterback, wide receiver, running back, do it all Kentucky player going to the Baltimore Ravens at num- uh, pick number 92 in April's draft. But with Lynn Bowden Jr., he's not coming in to play quarterback. He's not going to back up Lamar Jackson. But what he can do is do a lot of sub patch, sub package type of stuff, some gimmicky stuff in the backfield, be a weapon for this offense, because that's what this offense needs or not necessarily needs, but you know, lives with, you know, Limbo Jr. comes in and makes that rushing offense better with the compliment to Mark Ingram, Lamar Jackson, and those things. I also think he can be a competent slot receiver. I think we've talked about him as this running back slot receiver hybrid. And I think the Baltimore Ravens, with what they've done both offensively and defensively, they've shown they're willing to get creative with their playmakers, willing to find creative ways to get their best players to football. I think Limbo Jr. with this offense would do great things. I I think it would be great just to have him in the same backfield with Lamar Jackson and both guys being able to, you know, throw and, and do a lot of, you, you can have that, you know, the Heisman backfield, obviously he wasn't Heisman, but you can have that with RG three and him and just throw defense for a loop. Like, I don't know how you'd prepare for that. Uh, and also, like you said, they do need a slot. So I, I think his sort of versatility would be well used in a Greg Roman offense. That's for sure. I mean, you just have to sign up to be creative, sign up like, hey, I'm going to bring this guy in and we're going to pull together some packages for him to take advantage of his ability and put the defense on their heels. You know, like you said, it's hard to prepare for a player like Lynn Bowden, especially when paired with Robert Griffin III and Lamar Jackson. You're getting thrown so many different things. Yeah. All right. You jump to your next guy. All right. Next guy for me is 65 overall. Cincinnati Bengals, top of the third round, Mississippi State linebacker, <laughs> Willie Gay Jr. This one I love because the Bengals don't give a damn about off-field issues. Like, they've drafted, they had Pac-Man Jones in there for forever, the king of off-field issues. Uh, they had, uh, gosh, who's the Joe Mixon they drafted in the second round. Like, they, they don't take guys off their board for stuff. Uh, so Willie Gay punching his quarterback, getting suspended for cheating on a chemistry chest. That's not even going to move the needle for them. That, that, that may have moved them up higher on the Bengals board for all we know with what they, with their scouting department and what they covet. So I do think that it's, this one makes too much sense because it's talent wise. He's better than the 65th overall pick, but odds are he will fall to them in the third round. And they just need something at the linebacker position at this point. He's a lot more talented player than Jermaine Pratt. who They got in the third round there last year. And I also think this is so much better value at 65 than maybe grabbing or forcing a linebacker need at, with the 33rd overall pick. I think yeah. it'd be smarter to attack the wide receiver position with that pick than to go off ball linebacker. Willie Gay Jr. can do a lot of the same things that Patrick Queen and Kenneth Murray do. He's just got a little off field you're going to have to deal with. But I'm going to say this. I don't think Willie Gay Jr. is a bad guy like maybe Vontae's Perfect is a bad guy. Vontae's Perfect is bad on the field I mean, in terms of what he's done players and those things he's gotten suspended for that reason i think willie gay jr this isn't a pattern of misconduct with him i think it's a couple bad decisions i do think he can be honed in from what i've heard you just talked talk, to him that's all you, you i talked to him so here's my take right you got you hey. got the uh what was it the the i was telling about the scouts who spend one day with the guy and then all of a sudden they're on board because you, yeah. you got the agent speak to you you got the agent no. speak this is what I'll say. Willie Gay Jr. talked to him, seemed like a great guy. I talked to the social media team with Mississippi State, and they all said this guy's good. I mean, he's never been like a bad dude on the mic or those things. And Daniel Jeremiah said on his podcast that all the NFL teams that interviewed him said he crushed the interviews. I got multiple sources on this, okay? 
I'm not just right. falling in love because I had a handshake with him or whatever it was. But I do like the <laughs> Willie Gay Jr. pick to the Cincinnati Bengals. I'm going to jump to my next one here. Cameron Dancer, Mississippi State corner that probably fell off some boards with his 4-6 40-yard dash at the combine. But you, we spoke about this a little bit on previous podcasts, but the Buffalo Bills – ton of sense with Cameron Dancer because of what they do with the cornerback position. They're able to hide those weaknesses and win with cornerbacks that maybe don't have great top speed, like, you know, like, like what they've done, what they did previously or what Sean McDermott did previously with Josh Norman. I think him coming in to play opposite of Tredavious White would be, would be awesome. They also have Levi Wallace there. If things don't pan out quickly, I think Cameron Dancer, if he's going to win in a defense, I think what Sean McDermott puts on the table makes, uh, makes sense for that fit. Yeah. I mean, Levi Wallace, the, very similar, ran a four six three. There are other cornerback there, four six three, but with thirty two and three quarter inch arms, so a little a little longer than uh, than gosh, Cameron Dancer's name is looting me there. A little longer than Dancer, but I think that's like a similar sort of player that can get by. Like you don't need speed uh, at corner in that defense, and he obviously has succeeded there uh, despite being a UDFA. So yeah, we both love that fit for him. I don't know if he, I don't know. I bet he ends up falling a little more even than just because no one there's it's just going to be off boards. You know, like I said, that's like one of the only teams that's going to be willing to take a chance on him highly. And when you're the bills, you like, know that you're going to be one of the only teams that's going to be willing to take a chance on him highly. So you could even wait on him and he might fall to the third at this point. Yeah. I I wouldn't be surprised by that. And also, I mean, you you mentioned it that like there's, there's only a handful of teams that are even going to be willing to, you know, take a flyer on him. with speed he does have, I think Buffalo recognizes that as well. I think you're going to get good value though, drafting him in the third or fourth. Cause I still think you put good tape on, at Mississippi State, and maybe that that start for his forty yard dash was just awful. Like I mean, and yeah. I, I think, and I talked. You really I, didn't I, play like you didn't play <laughs> like that guy, like a, a four six four guy. And I, every yeah, prospect really I've been up. talking to, because I've kind of been enamored with the athletic testing and how important it is used. I talked to KJ Hamler and you'll listen to the interview soon in the podcast about the importance of the start and the 40 yard dash and how much it is like, that's all you do. Like you practice your start over and over and so much technique. And I also asked him, you know, with the three cone and the short shuttle, have you run them? He said he ran a four flat somewhere in the six eights for the three cone. But he said, all of that is technique. He's like, it's, it's not, it's so much of the three cone and short shuttle is technique that it's so hard to be actually indicative of your act, actual athletic ability. And I, I, I was not surprised by that, but again, time and time again, you hear like, Oh, he doesn't have good change of direction. He ran this 40, like with what George, Jerry Judy put on with the short shuttle, but it's like so much of that is technique. And if you have bad technique, I wouldn't necessarily say that makes you a bad athlete. All right. Jump off my rant of the, the testing and the, and the mm-hmm. technique there. Jumping to Zach Bond of Wisconsin, the off-ball linebacker edge type of hybrid. Going to the Baltimore Ravens. I, I think I always bring this up, but like you not gonna get, you're not going to let me go this time? Oh, uh, I didn't know. I, I didn't realize I was skipping you. I, I kind of got lost in the rant. I'll, I'll let me finish Zach Bond. You give Matt Hennessy. And you go back to back. Um, but with Zach Bond, I, I think there is a chance he goes in the back end of the first round because people will like his versatility in those things. But at 55, the Baltimore Ravens, I always bring up scheme and fit and usage so important for prospects baltimore like i said with Limbone jr offensively defensively is willing to get creative with their defensive players and with bond they'll throw him at the quarterback they'll allow him to rush the pass or what he was very good at at wisconsin i think they'll give him or allow him to do the versatile role he needs to succeed in the nfl because i'm convinced based on what we saw at the senior bowl and just the inexperience he had doing it at wisconsin that if he plays 800, 900 snaps at off ball linebacker and doesn't rush the passer a ton. You're not going to get a great, you know, a great production from him right out of the gate, maybe in the first one or two years, because he just doesn't have that experience playing that type of position and that type of assignment. But if you do throw him in the Ravens defense and ask him to rush the passer and do these things, play near the bottom line of scrimmage, I think you get better production from him. I think Baltimore would be the smartest with Zach Bond. I'd be surprised if he falls to them in the second round. It's the only thing. Like that's a ways for him to fall with how athletic he was. Like he had one of the best 10 times, uh, not just of any edge in this class, like of any edge in the last five or so classes. Like he had a really good get off and he is, you know, at a little over two at about two forty. Like he's still, some teams will still probably covet him to strictly play edge defender. Like I could see teams, uh, you know, three, four teams that have true outside linebacker sort of roles, still keeping him there. Uh, and then obviously like compared to this edge rushing class, like he has a lot of, a lot more you know, going for him than a lot of the guys you can find in that range. So I'd just be surprised if he fell that far. But obviously, we've talked about it. We love that fit. I mean, I was going to ask you, if, he, if Zach Bond was committed, 100% committed to playing edge defender at the next level, would your evaluation change of him? I don't think so because I, I think he's close enough and I think he's athletic enough to get by. Like, 
Clay Matthews came in the league at 240 uh, and had similar athletic testing. Like there are guys that can do it. You just have to be pretty darn athletic and have pretty good bend. And I think Bond possesses both of those. Like I, th- I think I'd still be willing to take a chance on him highly. All right, rattle off your next two guys. I'm sorry I skipped you. All right, next guy, Matt Hennessy, the t- central center from Temple to the Los Angeles Rams at 84 in the third round. Uh, I do think that Brian Allen ain't it. You know, last year he had a 58.6 overall grade in his first year as a starter uh, and got injured or didn't play down the stretch. So I, I just think they need someone at center uh, to come in. I think Matt Hennessy, very talented in his zone scheme, did a lot of the same stuff at Temple that he'd be doing with the Rams. Uh, obviously, uh, went to the Senior Bowl, played really well there. I had Paul Alexander text me the other day because he's working with him, asking why we're so low on him. I said, well, we're low on interior off the line in general. But and then Paul said, some guys he's talked to in the NFL have him as the top center on their board. So oh, wow. that's if he ends up making it 284. But I think one of those teams could be the Los Angeles Rams that have him as top center on the board because of the schematic fit there and how good Matt Hennessy is on the move. What was your opinion of his senior bowl? I mean, I feel like he had some good reps, but also it wasn't something that was utterly spectacular. Yeah, I didn't love him in pass protection at senior bowl. I thought he got a little too... Uh, he gets a little out over his toes and he can be thrown off balance a little too easily. And then we saw that kind of at the senior bowl, but uh, I mean, he plays really well in space. Like his game might not be pass protection out the gate, he'll, but I think he'll be a pretty solid run blocker. Like I said, in his own scheme. All right, go ahead and jump to your next guy. Go ahead and double dip. Oh, double dip. All right. I'm going to go Kayvon Wallace, the Clemson safety slash cornerback, really more of a slot cornerback, but going to the green Bay Packers at 94 overall. Cause I think Kayvon Wallace would be what they're missing in terms of they play a ton of nickel and a ton of dime. Probably, I think they played as much or if not close to, they were top three in the NFL. I remember in terms of dime usage last year. So their dime safety, who was really bad last year, was Will Redmond for most of the year. Sometimes it was Raven green for a while and then he got hurt, but they need, they need someone at that position or the slot. Like, I don't think that, I think Josh Jackson's penciled in the slot, the former second rounder at the moment. Uh, but obviously they haven't, loved him because he hasn't been able to see the field for the Packers defense. So I think Kayvon Wallace at minimum would be a massive upgrade in their dime safety role and something that they need could even play some dime backer, really physical dude. Uh, and I think one of my favorite sort of box players and coverage in this entire class. Man, Packers would be throwing some resource at the secondary. Yeah. Josh Jackson, you know, Jair Alexander, uh, I'm Kevin alluding to the Kevin King, uh, Darnell Savage. I mean, you're throwing some speed and athleticism on the back end there. It's, uh, it's unfortunate how few they have panned out. I mean, John Alexander is obviously the better, the better guy there with Kevin King up and down. Uh, Josh Jackson hasn't so, really panned yeah. out. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, all right, let's go to but my fit here. Back to me, KJ Hill to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at 76. I love this because there are people, you know, bringing up that you know Tom Brady needs a safety blanket. It's going to force him to lean on Cameron Brayton and OJ Howard more, and I think that's true. However, you bring in a slot receiver like KJ Hill, and we've comped him to like the West Welker, Julian Edelman types, and that not a special athlete, but just finds ways to get open on and it, like the short underneath or short and intermediate levels of the field. I mean, that's what Tom Brady wants. I think KJ Hill would be a very, very productive receiver with Tom Brady at the helm. I think he would get fed the football constantly find ways to get open. I think KJ Hill is like exactly what the bucks want and what Tom Brady wants for that offense. Yeah. I love that fit. I mean, so much we've talked about it, those, and the great part about, you know, Brady and what he likes and wide receivers and the routes he targets is that the Edelman's of the world, the Cooper cups of the world come cheap. Like those undersized route runners who can get open in the short and short area and short area routes they're not not super coveted in the NFL, but for Tom Brady, they're really coveted. That's the those yeah. are the routes he targets all the time. So like a third round pick. Not coveted for Bruce but, Arians either, though. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing. I'm not exactly sure where the offense goes and what it looks like next year, but I, I do at least just for Tom Brady, I think KJ Hill's a great fit for him. All right, you're up. All right, mine. I'm gonna go to Tom Brady's former team, the New England Patriots, 87, going Adam Troutman, the Dayton tight end. They just need someone with some hands and some reliability over the middle of the field. No, he's not Gronk. Will never be Gronk. Does not have great speed. Ran the four eights, but really good route runner, crafty route runner, and then great hands. Only two drops on 72 catchable last year. Scored 14 touchdowns uh, and broke 12 tackles after the catch. I I think this guy is still one of my favorite tight ends in a weak tight end class, despite not having great speed. I think he can be 
he can be at least again your underneath intermediate sort of guy, even though he probably won't win downfield. I mean, I love what he put on tape at the senior bowl. I, I thought he had a very good senior bowl. I was impressed. It's like, I mean, he was like, I mean, you bring up these like, you know, subdivision, you know, guys that aren't coming from big, bigger schools, but do they stand out among FBS competition? I think you saw that with Duggar, you saw that with Barch, and you saw that with Troutman. And I think that's what what's yeah. special and stands out for him. All right, moving to my next guy here, Bryce Hall to the Kansas City Chiefs. I think this fit makes a ton of sense. Also, I think falling to the Kansas City Chiefs at 63. Guys battled battled injury this past year, a season-ending injury. I think it was around 380 or so snaps into his 2019 season. He doesn't have a ton of a ton of experience in press though. And I think the chiefs run a ton of ran a ton of press this past year, at least up there with the top five teams in total press coverage snaps played, but he does have long arms. I do think he can play that well, cover one, cover three type of system and the chiefs need cornerback help. And if you can get Bryce hall, a healthy Bryce hall with the 63 overall pick, I think you're getting a ton of value with that pick. Yeah. I think that's the thing is he's really, he's really long. And obviously his second, he had the second biggest wingspan of any corner at the combine hasn't done a lot of press, but when he does, like he ends guys like that, that's what, that's what he should be realistically or feasibly good at the next level is playing press coverage. Chiefs play a ton of it, even though they're not super man heavy, they do a ton of press zone concepts, a lot of cover two, that sort of thing. So I, I think that's actually a perfect sort of play for Hall at the next level is go to a system where yes, you can press at the line of scrimmage, but also that you're not following guy the entire route because exactly that's not what he's going to be great at. Yeah. All right, last fit, last fit. Last fit. Tenth fit here. I'm going to go pick number 102. It's a compensatory. Pittsburgh Steelers going to Tani Muti, the guard from Fresno State. He's going to fall. It's going to be impossible not to. He's played only like 300 snaps the past two years. <laughs> Achilles injury, Liz Frank injury, big-ass dude. Team's just going to worry about when you have lower body injuries like that, that they're going to be recurring, that you're never going to see the football field. But at this point, Beggars can't be choosers. You know, the Steelers need to take a chance on someone on that offensive line. Uh, yes, they got Stefan Wisniewski over the course of the year, but he's been a journeyman sort of better as a backup kind of guy over the course of the ha- last few years. So I do think that they can go uh, off the line at that point. And Tani Muti is a Pittsburgh Steelers type of guard, like a people mover, get you off the line of scrimmage type of guard that I think fits their scheme very, very well. Natani Muti falls to the back end of day two, top of day three, and plays even like two full seasons on his rookie contract. You're getting great value because this guy's going to be very good when healthy. I think you can count on that. He's ranked inside the top 50 on PFF's board, knowing that if he's healthy, he can be one of the more competent guards in the NFL. The problem is, is you're just there is a fat question mark, probably as big as himself about his injury concerns and those things. All right, I'm going to finish it off with the guy that we're going to be listening to next, the interview, KJ Hamler of Penn State, going to the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes, I know they have Deshaun Jackson, but he's also 33 years old, a little bit long in the tooth. And I think KJ Hamler comes in to play the slot. Deshaun Jackson plays a lot outside and learn from his mentor. I talked to KJ Hamler. He said, I, I asked him, like, what kind of players do you watch? People try and compare you to players. He's like, no, Deshaun Jackson's great. Like, everyone compares me to Deshaun Jackson. I think that's me. Like, I can be <laughs> that type of player at the next level. So I think he looks up to him in a lot of ways. And also, his game is a lot like that. A fast dude, coveted for his speed, can separate at the intermediate level as well. And also, very good after the catch. I, we went through, like, the whole interview, eight, ten minutes in the interview. Didn't even bring it up. But, like, this guy, very good after the catch as well. I think the Eagles want speed, explosiveness, Big playability on that offense with J.J. Ortega-Whiteside and Alshon Jeffrey not being those types. I think K.J. Hamler to Philly at 53 to help you know work behind Deshaun Jackson but also get mixed into the offense would be awesome. Yeah, if he's there at 53, I would much rather have him in the second round than in the slot than Justin Jefferson in the first round in the slot just, just purely for the Philadelphia Eagles because like they, if everyone's healthy, if Deshaun Jackson's healthy, if J. Jaws is healthy, if Alshon Jeffrey, if they're all healthy, like – they really don't need another wide receiver. It was just because everyone got banged up towards the end of last year that it got really ugly. I mean, they need someone at wide receiver, but they don't need like a first round type of wide receiver. So that's why you can go elsewhere in the first round, maybe get a bigger impact and then add just that speed guy in case Deshaun Jackson does go down. So, you know, teammate opposing te- defenses have to respect some speed on your roster, get that in the second round. And KJ Hamler, obviously dude probably would have ran the four threes if we got to see him test. Yeah, he said he tested in the four threes when he first got to Exos, clocked a four two seven after, you know, doing a lot of the training on the start and those things, and then ended up injuring his hamstring, practicing the flying twenties. Uh all right, that's gonna do it. Let's not that's gonna do it. With that being said, let's cut to the KJ Hamler interview. Give that a listen. And when we come back, we're going bar fights, perfect pairings, and had too many. The last three segments of the podcast. 
Joining the Two for One Drafts podcast is KJ Hamler, Penn State wide receiver. This is Austin Gale. KJ, it's great to have you on. I hope you're staying safe. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. I hope you are too. Of course, man. Well, I want to get right into it and talk about just how coronavirus and this COVID-19 pandemic is affecting you. I know you weren't able to participate at the combine due to a hamstring injury. What have you done? And you, and your pro day was canceled due to the pandemic right now. What have you done for NFL teams to show that athletic testing? Have they asked for videos? What, what exactly are they looking for from you? Yeah. Um, a lot of teams ask for videos. Um, you know, it's kind of hard, you know, getting outside right now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a missionary right now. So. 30 degrees so um but i think one of these days i'm gonna you know just get up record some stuff um have a film crew out there record me running routes and you know doing the rest of the stuff just to show them i have good ball skills and you know that i am actually fast so um mm-hmm. you know just just a lot of stuff just to get my name out there as much as, as much. yeah i think that makes sense have, have you sent like video recordings of you running a 40 yard dash or any of those things or are you more looking to get videos recorded of you running routes and that I think more videos of me, you know, running routes and, you know, ball skills and stuff like that. I think that was the team's, a lot of teams' most concern um, was my ball skills because, you know, I had some drops this year, so I'm not proud of. But, you know, I just mm-hmm. want to show them that, you know, I have good ball skills. I don't have bad hands. So um, just going out there and just recording that stuff. Gotcha. And I read the article on NFL.com from Mike Garofalo talking about, they, you know, they requested your GPS data or whatever, or how fast you how fast you ran um, at Penn State. It looks like you clocked 21.7 miles per hour as a redshirt freshman and 21.58 this past year. Do you think you get faster in the NFL? Where do you think you go there? I think um, most definitely I can get faster. Um, I think a lot of those times when they when they time those and clock those times were, uh, were me, I think I was slowing down a little bit, you know. Like mm-hmm. sometimes I have to use my full speed at some time. So um, I for sure think I can, I can let it all go, yes, sir. Yeah, when you were at the Combine, what did teams tell you they liked about your game? Obviously, your speed standouts, people compare you to Deshaun Jackson in that way. But what else did they say they like about what you bring to the table as a receiver? Um, just, the, just the chip on my shoulder I play with. Um, you know, my playmaking ability, you know. Uh, game, which uh, a lot of them were surprised about. You know, I'm a small stature guy, but, you know, uh, on my game, you know, just a, they, just, they just like how I'm a tough player, you know, and I give everything I got 100% of the time. Do, do you watch any NFL players or do you compare yourself to NFL, any NFL players? I think this entire pre-draft process, everyone tries to compare prospects to players. But do you have, like, a player in mind that you watch or you think you kind of cater your game after? Um, For sure, Deshaun Jackson. You know, <laughs> since I started playing wide receiver, so um, school, high school, when he was in college at Cal. So um, I think I was, I'm always a big fan. Uh, Jax, I think me and him are similar, um, you know, play styles, you know, so uh, I think, yeah, he's the best fit for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good, man. That's good. And yeah. another thing I want to bring up, too, is, you know, you speak to watching film on NFL players and those things, but in a given game week, how much film are you watching? I, I know for the receiver position and other positions as well, it's important to opponent scout, look at the cornerback, what they're going to do against you. Can you talk to me about what you do in a given game week to prepare on film? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, this – this past season, um, Coach Parker, who was my wide receiver coach, was a big influence in my life. Um, he's like a second father figure to me. So he really, you know, taught me how to slow the game down and, um, you know, and how to watch film. You know, I would always go like five, four times out the week. I would always go over his house just to watch film with him. Um, we'd break down, you know, from coverages to, you know, what type of technique the corner uses to what type of defense, you know, the overall team is uh, mainly using. So um, just watching that like four times out of the week, with him, you know, for hours, and then I watch it on my own as well. So uh, I, I, I became a film junkie this past season. So, yeah, man, that's that's good. That's good to hear. I also want to go back to the testing a little bit. I read that you clocked a four three six while working with Exos, and you were planning to clock in the four twos if you did were able to participate at the combine. Do you feel like that's your range from a four yard dash standpoint, the four two four three type of range? Well, yeah. Um, when I first got that. So I, I clocked 436, but um, after training in weeks, I clocked at 427. So, oh, okay. um, I feel like I could have went faster. Um, you know, I'm disappointed I couldn't showcase my speed, but, you know, I, I chose to take a route just for the health of my hamstring. You know, I didn't want this to be a nagging injury or a mm-hmm. long-term injury because I've never had a soft t- a tissue injury besides that. Um, so, um, you know, I was very disappointed I couldn't run, but, you know, um, 
just blessed and, you know, thank God I'm in this opportunity I'm in. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be here. So, uh, you know, just give praise to him that I even got a chance to go to the combine and be around different guys, different caliber guys, you know. Um, so it was a great experience. So I, I talked to a lot of prospects and asked them about the 40-yard dash because I think so much of it, in addition to obviously speed, so much of it is the start. How much, mm-hmm. when you were training, did you train to kind of just like master your start from a technique standpoint? Yeah, that was that was my biggest thing. You know, I think – um you know, I didn't have the right technique going into it. And then once I learned, you know, how to how to start and, you know, how to explode out of there, it, it became better. But it's still you always got to be consistent with it. You know, it's um it's not an easy thing to do, Um, you know, just how they want, you know, how they want you to keep your foot close to the ground and and all of this stuff. So uh, it was it was a difficult thing for me. But once I got it down pack, I got it down pack. And, you know, just for me not to showcase that it was disappointing. But um, I feel like. You know, I put in all that hard work, and I just couldn't run at the combine, which was, was saddening for me. But, you know, like I said, it was a blessing just to be a part of this whole process. I, I saw that you're working with former Penn State receiver and current Broncos receiver Deshaun Hamilton. Can you talk about what he's what he's teaching you and what he's kind of explaining to you through this process? Yeah, um, Ham is like my big brother. Um, you know, we talk we talk almost once a week, twice a week. Um, I just ask him, you know, what, like what's all the details for rookies and stuff of that nature. He always keeps it honest with me, um, you know, and I, he always sends me film of his one on ones and how to run routes because he's probably one of the most most guys with the best technique I've seen so far. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, he just he just giving me knowledge on the game, you know, just how to conduct yourself in NFL, um, you know, how to do stuff in NFL the right way. And so I look up to him a lot. So that's that's my guy. Uh, speaking to running routes, how much, how much, how important is that to you to improve at the next level? Do you see that as an area where you want to improve the most, or what have teams said that where they want you to get better at the next level? Um, well, I think everybody just has concern because of, of my drops this year. So, okay, um, I don't think my drops concerned to me having bad hands. It was just more of a focus standpoint for me. So, you know, just turning up field too fast um, before even securing the ball. So, that was my main problem, and I worked on it, you know, in the off season and during the season. You know, I've gotten way better at it, just, you know, looking the ball all the way in through the tuck. So that was the main thing. But route running, you know, I think that's the key of being a receiver. Um, you know, just I think the game has changed a lot in the NFL. Um, you know, creating separation is probably the main thing that a lot of people look for. So I think I'm very good at that, you know, changing, um, switching directions very fast. So uh, I think that's what a lot of teams look for. Have you had an opportunity to send videos or test in the short shuttle or, or three cone? And do you have times for those that you've recorded at Exos or wherever you are now? Um, I have times at Exos. Um, my fastest time in the in the shuttle was I think a four flat. Um, okay. And my fastest three time I think was a six eight. So mm-hmm. uh, um, I worked on those, even though the technique is kind of hard to do. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I haven't. That's another one of those any, thrills, though. That's another yeah. one of those thrills where technique is so much is so important, yeah. and sometimes it can't. You know, the end time won't be indicative of what you can actually mm-hmm. do. From a change of direction standpoint, I think a receiver that comes to mind is, is Jerry Judy of Alabama, a guy who has some very good change of direction skills, but didn't have necessarily a fantastic short shuttle. So I think yeah. technique again is important. But um, going back to to what you were saying, I think I'd also want to bring up, you know, I talked to a lot of receiver prospects in this class and in previous classes. I always ask them what you think is most important to being a receiver. Some bring up contested catchability, catching every pass on their way, separation, like you said, would you, I know you kind of hinted at it, but would you say separation is kind of that number one thing at the next level that you should look for? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think a lot of teams look for that, you know, um, you know, getting open is, is the main thing, you know, if your quarterback can rely on you to get open um, in any type of situation, you know, I think that's the best thing. So creating separation and route running is probably the most important thing, you know, but um, because you can't, you can't get, yeah. you can't catch the ball if you're not open. So um, I think that's the most important thing for me. Another part of that too is releases at the line of scrimmage and mm-hmm. playing in the slot a lot like you did at Penn State. Maybe you didn't see as much press coverage as some of the other you know draft prospects in this class. You know wh- what are you doing now to work on your releases and how that how important of the, is that in the process? Yeah, um, you know I I do a lot of receiver work with um with uh my guy Mason. Um, he's a trainer. He's been training for a while now. So. Um, and I line up on the outside most of the time just to, you know, for receiver work. So, um, you know, I've, I've been a lot press coverage and a lot of that stuff during practice. So I'm kind of used to it, but a lot of times I wasn't press coverage in the game. So, um, I'm used to it at the same time, but I still work on it from the outside standpoint because a lot of teams, you know, haven't seen me play on the outside, which I know I can, I know I'm capable of. So, 
um, you know, just getting prepared for any situation, you know, any spot a team wants to put me in, you know, so I can just be tip top shape and 100 percent in my craft. Yeah, let's stay there for a little bit, because I think usage for the receiver position is super important. Knowing where you want to play a certain receiver of this skill set at the next level, whether he's in slot, there's also these gimmicky types playing in the backfield and those things. But do you have you know a position in mind or usage in mind at the next level? Do you want to be a slot guy, guy that can play outside? I'd be interested to know where you think you play your best in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm for sure, you know, most comfortable in the slot, you know, because I've played there for the past three years. So. Um, but I think, you know, if I moved to the outside, it wouldn't be uncomfortable for me at all because um, I ran a lot in practice. You know, I went against, you know, a lot of good guys, corners um, in practice, you know, Tariq Castro Fields, um, John Reed, Lamont Wade, you know, some of my old teammates um, will give me a hard time, you know, so just <laughs> press coverage and stuff of that nature. So we always work to get better. But, you know, I think that moving me to the outside or, you know, even if you want to put me in the backfield, you can do whatever. So, um I think, you know, just as long as I'm able to contribute to the team as any way possible is the big thing for me. Something we haven't even brought up feels like an elephant in the room at this point is your ability after the catch. I mean, you turn on the highlights for KJ Hamler, and this guy does, you know, damage after the catch, forcing missed tackles, and obviously that speed shows up as well. Talk about the difference between creating separation and the technique and tools you need to do that, and actually when you get the ball in your hands, making a play with it. Yeah, I think, you know, after all the route running and, you know, getting separation that's just technique wise you know that's stuff that you work on but you know the things after the catch that I do I think it's just God given um I think a lot of people have that you know that God given ability and awareness you know and vision so um you know I can only give that up to the to the man most high you know so um you know I just I, I visualize it as when every time I touch the ball I have to score that's just that's just my mentality at it um so it's just like that and run, run away from a pit bull. So it's a <laughs> mixture, mixture of both. That's great, man. Well, I really appreciate your time, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. I hope this process isn't you know, too, too stressful on those things. I know uh, you'll come out of it on top. But, again, thanks for the time. Thank you. I appreciate you. Have a blessing. Good stuff from KJ there. I mean, I, I, I'm, I apologize again for the beginning of that audio. It was a little choppy to start, but we got some better Wi-Fi or Internet connection towards back end. That's where the stuff got valuable. What I found most interesting about it was just him talking about like what he sees is valuable at the wide receiver position. He says separation is what matters. Getting open is what matters. I found that interesting. Also, his active catch ability is awesome. Still love that's, that fit. To, go ahead. That's like you. Uh, that's like when you – interviewed Tristan where he's like yeah the broad jump that's the one that translates KJ Hamler yeah the one thing I do that's what oh matters. no that's but what I, I, I the thing I'm is kidding. though no, I, I know. agree I'm kidding. It is. I agree, agree with yeah. KJ Hamler I, I agree that you got to get open in order to be a successful receiver in the NFL but I also it's not it's not surprising he didn't bring up ball skills like Michael Pittman did yeah, I, I was mean, gonna Michael say remember, Pittman. <laughs> remember Michael Pittman hey even when I'm not open I'm open yeah so that's uh, not, 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 I guess not surprised by those answers all right let's go uh let's go bar fight here Pick. Well, let's fight over this one here. What would it take to get the bangle? No, to get to the number one overall pick for the Cincinnati Bengals. I believe that there still is a price. Everything has a price. You're not. You're not going to completely. Even though I love Joe Burrow, think he's undoubtedly the top quarterback in this class. There would be something that I would take to move out of that number one overall pick. Now, the trade chart, the old school, you know outdated Jimmy Johnson trade chart says it should only take picks. So if you're my Miami Dolphins are the team that you'd feasibly trade with or the ones who's rumored to be moving up or wants to move up to number one overall. The, the trade chart says it should take five, 18 and 39 is all it should take. And that's surplus value to get the number one overall pick. Now that trade chart's gone out the window in recent years, especially when you're trading up for quarterback, you always have to play, pay a massive premium. And so I think the fact that when you're trading down in the Bengals case, if you're, I think the reason they still kind of have Andy Dalton on that roster is because they would entertain a trade down. And for me, it would take five, 18, 26, 39 and 56. So all picks I, I, in the first two rounds, that's what it would take for me because at five, you're no, you're no shoe in to get to a tongue by lower there. Like you're the charges are jumping you. You're going to have to give up a couple of those picks to get back up and get to a, so to me, with how much I see Burrow above Tua in a vacuum at this point, it would take those picks. What about Frio? I mean, uh, there's just I don't know. If, I, I don't know. It's an interesting. I don't think it takes all of them. I think you can. I think you can keep 
pick 56. I think I think the Miami Dolphins can keep pick 56, but I do agree that it shouldn't just be pick 5, 18, and 39. That's absurd. If you're trading up yeah. to go grab Joe Burrow, a, a quarterback that should alter your franchise, you're gonna I'm gonna need all three of your first rounders and that 39th overall pick. 56 you can keep. But here's what here's what I'll say on that is I don't think I don't think it would be smart for the Cincinnati Bengals if they did trade down to five to even think about a quarterback anymore. You're calling it. You're yeah. like, hey, we're not we're not getting Joe Burrow now. We're gonna t- we're gonna add. Say you did. Say they got this dream treasure trove that you just mapped out for us. Five, eighteen, twenty six, thirty nine, fifty six. Dude, build up that defense. Add some receiving talent in this class, and let's let's go grab Justin Fields or you know Trevor Lawrence next year. I would I would willfully start Ryan Finley in twenty twenty. I mean that's what I would do because I think it doesn't make sense to trade down to five and then maybe trade some of that capital to go grab Tua Tunga Vailoa because at that point you just traded down to get a worse quarterback that could potentially never play it down in the NFL with injury risk. I think if they did take this offer, which I think is maybe a pick too rich, I think they completely opt out of the quarterback race and they say, hey, here comes Justin Fields, Ohio State, get all that fan base coming down to Cincinnati. I, I, think, that's, I think that's the move. That would be an all-time the process, you know, sort of tank job to t- trade down, cut Dalton or, you know, trade Dalton, whatever they're going to do with Andy Dalton, start Ryan Finley for a year and just roll in with a bunch of rookies who then in year two break out with Trevor Fields or Justin or Jesus, Trevor Lawrence or Justin <laughs> Fields. That would be an all time sort of play on their part. I don't think it's going to happen. No, no way. I mean, I don't think they're going to trade down. I, I think they're already locked in. Cincinnati media is locked in. Can you think about all the people we've talked to in Cincinnati media? If Joe Burrow is not selected number one overall, all that they've done to kind of build up the season, there's such high expectations by obviously Bengals fans, but also guys at the Cincinnati Inquirer, the Athletic, who, who uh, write about Cincinnati, ESPN. They're all super excited to finally have a quarterback that could potentially put this team in a good position to win football games. Can you imagine? It's like, yeah, just kidding. Put that off a year. Here comes Ryan Finley. This entire, I mean, this entire city would be burned to the ground. And I I also feel like with, you know, Cincinnati and they're being one of the smaller market clubs. I feel like Jersey sales is not an inconsequential part to their bottom line. You know, like being, being having a guy that would move the needle like that in terms of Jersey sales would be, uh, it would be worth in and of its worth using the number one pick out in him, like in and of itself, without even like the on field uh, added value. Like, just and it goes back to this and, too. Yeah. It goes back to this too. What are your expectations for 2020? Are your expectations to increase revenue by X percentage, to put more people in the stands, all these things? And yeah, the pick's obvious. You go grab Joe Burrow and you do it very quickly. If your expectations like, no, we're willing to play the field, you know, revenue is not super important. We want to win football games. What puts our you know football team in the best position to succeed? Maybe you do entertain this offer of, you know, five or six picks, maybe a future first rounder and those things. I think it's interesting to think about it in the business mindset. Let's jump to the next segment here. Perfect pairings. First one, I'll start because it's kind of ridiculous, but Denzel Mims, Compared to Julio Jones lights, and I wrote in the notes here, LFG. I think it's obviously too rich comparing any receiver in football to Julio Jones is kind of absurd because he's that freaky of an athlete. But when you do look at what Denzel Mims did at the combine, his size and what he put, he put on tape at Baylor and at the Senior Bowl, a lighter version, an extremely like say to Julio Jones is level 10 in this scenario, like level two Julio Jones is a lot like what Denzel Mims can do for an offense at the next level because he has similar explosive athletic abilities. He's a freak athletic. He athletically has that size. I don't know. Renner, rip me apart. You hate it. Two tenths of Julio Jones doesn't sound that great. I'll just no, say. true. Okay. I was just trying to really water it down to the point where maybe you just didn't make fun of him. Oh, I'm still going to make fun of you no matter what. Don't fair, worry about fair. that. But um, they have similar body types and similar sort of athletic traits to a degree. I think Julio Jones still moves just a little bit differently on a football field, but I, I will say, I don't, I don't hate it. It's not as bad as some of your comps when you throw out comps on Twitter and you give like two different guys yeah, or you give like a massively something. like different. What was you had one that was like I, someone, I remember, but without like this guy, this guy without ball skills, a different, yeah. a different phase. Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> Those ones, at least it's not that one, but that this, I can kind of see in terms of, you know, if you're, Copying Denzel Mims to one guy, but then like giving one caveat. I do think to Julio Jones isn't bad when you say it's like Julio Jones, but you know, not even close to the level of like polish or like yeah. pure physicality he had coming out, but a lot of the same traits. So I can see it. Right. I can see give, it. Uh, give me your pairing. All right. My perfect pairing is Notre Dame cornerback. And this one's so boring. I don't know why I went 
Notre Dame, like a third round cornerback, but Troy pride jr. I thought very similar and could even have a very similar career path to Ronald Darby. Ronald Darby was a track star. Uh, or was a track athlete coming into Florida state and, and Ronald Darby actually initially committed to Notre Dame. If you'll remember back in the day before revoking that going to Florida state came out, was a second rounder uh, by the bills and it just kind of, they both have all the physical tools. They're both six foot one ninety three coming out four, four to sub four, four speed, all the physical tools you could want, but just like something's missing with them. Something's just a little off. They're just not great at the catch point. They just have reps where you're like, man, they should be better than that. than they consistently are. And that's how I felt about Darby over the course of even his NFL career that damn, he's just like, he should be better than he's playing. I feel the same way about pride where it just has all the skills. Just why isn't it come together in a little bit why isn't it coming together better, better than it has on the football field? So, yeah, that's- I would say with, I would say with Darby and I like the comp, I think it's a good pairing. I will say with Darby though, I think I see more Darby biting, making mental, making more mental mistakes than I do with pride. I think pride that they both, I mean, both lose the catch point in those things that aren't like playing to the level that their athletic ability would suggest. But I think Darby, what comes to mind always with him is kind of how much he bites on double moves and these things and kind of makes, makes mental errors or overconfidence errors. I think with pride, it's more, some of it's like technique. Some of it's like learning to finish plays. And I remember talking about senior bowl. I mean, first thing you mentioned is like, I just need to learn to like finish plays. Like I can stick with most of the receivers I've got against, but like getting my head to the football, putting the hand where it needs to be and actually forcing an incompletion is kind of the next step for him. And I think, I don't know. I think Troy Pye Jr. is closer to becoming a better version of Ronald Darby I, I, or, or has a better chance of becoming a better version of Ronald Darby than Ronald Darby, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I don't think Ronald Darby is <laughs> becoming a better version of himself anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> this entire segment's been a disaster for me. Uh, all right, I've had too many. That's a perfect that transition. Yeah, perfect transition to the had too many segment. Like we said at the beginning of the podcast, for these, the goal is going to be to bring up some other takes that we're seeing surface around the internet and talk about maybe how much how much drink that, how much beer they've had to have had to send that out. But today we'll bring up some of our worst ones, and I'll start at the beginning yeah. of the year or you know prior to the start of the season, even a couple weeks into the season. I was raving, un- unjustly raving about Aesop Winston Jr., the Washington State wide receiver that honestly put some good reps on tape. And I've seen sprinkles, <laughs> I've seen sprinkles of highlights on Twitter recently, but this dude didn't receive a combine invite. I- I'm pretty sure he's, no one's even heard of him. I mean, most people have not heard of him, but some of the reps I liked is a former uh, Juco transfer that um, I-, I just don't think he has the athletic ability to do so. But like, I mean, just some of the reps and some of his releases I thought were impressive. But this guy's not going to the NFL. He's not going to get drafted. I think uh, the hype, the hype train was just unjust in, in, at the beginning of the season. <laughs> what's that? What's that NCAA commercial where it's like most of us will be pursuing a career other than sports? That's <laughs> Aesop Winston's like the end guy. Unfortunate. If he does make it to the NFL though, and I backtrack, backtrack and backtrack, <laughs> this, I'm going to feel like an asshole. The the funny thing is, his teammate Desmond Patman is actually like actually got invited to the combine. Yeah, and and actually get I, I, I'm going to still stand on this. I think Aesop Winston Jr. is better than Patton or Patton. I, I think I, I, I will. We know you do. <laughs> I will stand by that tape. I I I will say it wasn't crazy. Like I think he should at least get a shot. Uh, he's not just completely, uh, you know, untouchably bad. But I, I don't think you, you <laughs> got glad. a little. You got a little out of control with the hype. I'm glad he's not untouchably bad. That would be that would be rough. All right, go ahead. All right, mine. And this one, I've been crying over it all year long. And the, the Jared Pinkney preseason hype that I gave of a potential first rounder. What I don't give, I don't say tight ends are ever first rounders. I'm not on board with ever that. But I said he might be one that I draft in the first round. And boy, he he just looked like a different player altogether. I don't know like what tape I was watching or what, but 2018 looked great. And 2019 did not. And then he ran a four nine and now he's off our one fifty altogether. So I mean it's been a cat it's been a cataclysmic fall. I mean the senior bowl I think was yeah, the most telling. Like yeah. I mean the senior bowl was like, oh my gosh, he can't create separation in the drill you're supposed to win. <laughs> like the, the tight end linebacker drill at the senior bowl is awful because tight ends and running backs win that every time. It's so hard to stick with them in one on one coverage. But Jerry Pinkett was getting blanketed, like legit blanketed in that drill. Very impressive. I, I, did you have another hand? Too many I had a tape? bonus. I had a bonus. Had too many, but this one, the caveat was this was two years ago when he was true freshman. But I said that AJ Epinesa was going to be a top ten pick. Oh God, he vaulted <sighs> it. I guess it's not too late, but it was a vault me. 
I mean, it uh. still could happen if someone loses their mind, but gave a vault me on it officially said it, put it in the vault. And, uh, I don't think that vault's going to be opening up anytime soon. I might need to with, dig up that tweet. I might need to dig up that tweet. To be fair, and also it said Chase Young and AJ Epinesa. I put both of them. So Chase Young's oh, going to okay. make him smart. There you go. So you're, you're fine. So you only had a few too many. Yeah, but I did have a few too. Fun stuff, dude. I really appreciate you ripping into me for my Aesop Winston Jr. love and my terrible Denzel Mims comp. I, I just feel like you make me better. You make me a better person and, and work to be work to strive to be the guy that is you. But uh, thanks again for everyone listening. Remember to submit a review, leave a uh, leave a review and leave your email. And we're going to be sending a draft guide to five people that do leave their review, leave a review with their email. But until Friday, this is 2 for 1 Drafts with Austin Gale and Mike Renner.